This is the Friday, June 9th, 2017 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is John Roach. John, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Well, and we are very glad to have you. We're glad because we've got a lot of great questions from our followers on Facebook and Twitter. We encourage all of you to find us on uh, whatever social media site you like. We're happy to take any question. To begin with, we've got a question here from our buddy Phil up in Ontario, Canada. He's on Twitter at Agridome. Phil wants to know, does this crop year slash price scenario right now strongly resemble last year when the corn price topped out June 18th? Can we expect that again? You know, Phil, that's a really good question. And, and, and yes, I think it very much resembles last year. Where, you know, we, we, and, we, and really for the last couple of years, we, we've come into this time of year with plentiful supplies in the bin by and large, and uncertainty in the field. And then that uncertainty, which when it didn't rain and didn't rain and didn't rain, started to scare us to death, suddenly changed. The rains came, and surprise, surprise, we raised the biggest crops we've ever raised, which nobody was thinking that in June. So we're in exactly the same position. Have we hurt the crop enough so that we're going to, to, to lose the yield? Maybe, but probably not. It's too soon to tell. That's what people tell me. And so um, uh, as long as we can get enough kind of moisture to keep us along, there's plenty of moisture down underneath in most places. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, yes, we could change this around very quickly with rains, uh, or we could accelerate it pretty rapidly without rain. And, and, I, and I think that that's the key to understand is just exactly how powerful the market could be if the weather doesn't cooperate, because we have all of this uh, energy that's underneath the market in the form of speculative shorts that came into this whole rally with record or near record short positions and now those short positions are, are hurting and they're getting out of them. So the weather is stimulating technical buying, it's also stimulating some user buying and as a consequence we've got the market up this far and, uh, and last year that's exactly what happened. It went on for another week or so and then it rained. Yep. And when the rains came, the weather problem was over, and uh, and we have to be aware that that could be exactly what happens again this year. These these market these opportunities could be very short lived, given these the the shorts coming out of the market and the fact that we're you're exactly right, just waiting on rain. I looked at the, the ten day forecast for East Central Iowa, and I think we're expected to be hundred degrees over the weekend, with like a fifty percent chance of rain next Thursday, and we haven't had rain, and I believe we're coming up on fifteen days, but crop still looks good. One rainstorm and hey, we're in good shape. And they'll probably still look good in a week because they're at that stage in their development where they sink the roots down, it finds water and so forth. But, but the, the, the marketplace will not be patient with that. Yes. The marketplace will grab a hold of that on Monday morning. I mean, we're going home today on Friday afternoon. I can't imagine a more bullish forecast in weather. Right. I mean, you just gave it to me. Yeah. And so if that, if that's where we're trading. And so, so we already have some of that weather discounted, if not maybe quite a little bit of it. But next week, we're going we're gonna to play the game all over again. Yep. Nothing in the USDA reports today will take away our weather market. The weather market's still solidly here. And did anything on those USDA WASDE reports jump out as a shock to you? Or was, looked to me like it was all fairly in line with analysts' expectations? If there was a surprise, it was that the wheat crop's a little bit better than they thought. Okay. I mean, that was really the only the, the surprise we saw there. Uh, and when we had some better crops, some wheat crops around the world that were a little yes. bit better. Uh, but uh, otherwise, not much of a surprise. Okay. Very small number differences compared to the guesses. Right, which leaves the weather market in full force. Uh, next question is also from our buddy Phil up in Ontario, Canada. He says, can we expect a corn acreage surprise in the USDA report on June 30th? Or in lieu of that, has the corn crop been compromised by tough spring conditions? You know, the, uh, we certainly have had uh, some, uh, a lot of replants. We're already in some of the northern regions. We're past the insurance date. You have to have the crop planted, uh, and it's not, and, and so people will decide not to plant. Uh, and so prevent plant will, will probably be bigger. Uh, people are talking maybe it could take a million or a million and a half acres out of corn. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that might be a little bit aggressive, but, but they're pretty smart people that are saying that. So I, uh, I guess I'm, I'm of the opinion here that, that we've had the bad news on corn. Now we're going to play with the good news for a little while. Okay. Now, bear in mind, the weather's going to be in there and it's going to be a component of it, but, but the news is, is better than what the news was. And, uh, uh, and, and that's a different psychology than, than, than we had in the market up through uh, the last uh, several months. The news being better meaning, I, I, for lack of a better word, more bearish or bearish leaning for the corn crop. We've got, the, we've already digested tough spring, we've di digested replants. Now we're looking at we need demand and we need uh, 
uh, moisture to keep the crop growing. Yeah, but I don't think I said that right. Okay. What I really was trying to say is that that we've had such a negative attitude around the corn market for months. Gotcha. And now suddenly in one week, we have a more positive attitude. And are we only going to get a week of it? And, and, and what my suggestion is, is that no, there's several things out here impacting this corn crop and the corn market and okay. corn demand that are positive. Um, I, uh, w w before uh, the president of China came to visit uh, President Trump in uh, Mar-a-Lago in Florida, uh, we were scared to death of what kind of a problem we were going to have with China and how it was going to impact the trade. And I mean, remember all, and as it turned out, uh, all for naught. Yeah. Looks looks like we're better friends than, than we were before. Yes, yeah, somebody's and, still buying an awful lot of beans, John Roach. It was unknown. <laughs> But somebody's out there buying. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. So I, I, I just think we're in a more positive atmosphere okay. now than what we've been in. And, and don't forget to put that into your thought process a little bit. Gotcha. Uh, next question is from Jackie in Colorado. Jackie is on Twitter at JKHolland89. Jackie wants to know, we talked about this on the program. This is a great question, Jackie. Will the aging waterway system impact long-term commodity pricing and supply? Uh, more interesting to me is it will impact users and processors' decisions on where they locate plants and 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 work around the government. The, the government is notoriously slow in making those improvements to waterways and so forth. But the industry is is very uh, adept at figuring out where the best place is to put the next plant. And so we've taken areas that used to have the worst corn bids in the state of Iowa and turned them into some of the best corn bids because there's three ethanol plants there. And so the, the, the industry works around whatever problem that you, that you give it. Uh, and so um, the more interesting aspect of that conversation is between now and the time they get the, the rivers fixed, how will the industry change to take advantage of that slowed transportation? Yeah. And, and what we've seen so far is we need less of the river traffic than we used to need. That's true. Or we, we're utilizing the river in a different way. We're, you know, shipping fertilizer and beans out, not necessarily all the corn going down the Mississippi, as an example. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Interesting. Final question from uh, Ronald in Bremer County, Iowa. He's on Twitter at RK Zelly. With no cell signals on corn or beans, and of course we do have a cell signal on corn, as you mentioned on the program, uh, and this is the prime time to sell and it's running out, what should a producer holding old crop waiting for a signal do? Sell. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, I hate to sell when there's no cell signal, and I've had cell signals, all of them at higher price levels that we've taken advantage of, uh, but if a market doesn't quite get up to give you a sell signal, but you have several other ingredients, the weather, the technical fund covering, the, the, the funds covering, the short position, and so you have those ingredients, just dribble out smaller sales. Cut the quantity, but don't, but don't leave yourself in a lurch where you're stuck with inventory coming in to harvest and miss the whole selling season. Gotcha. You know, so uh, go ahead and make sales, just make, just make them small. And, and when we get our next cell signal in beans, you, you know, you don't, you, you'll have one or maybe two, and then that's it. Yeah. So incremental sales minimize or at least reduce your risk a little bit. Reduce the size of your inventory. The reason, I, I'm guessing this, but the reason he's asking this question is he's got a bigger inventory on hand than what he's really comfortable with. Yeah. And, and a lot of people are in that position, yes. particularly on corn. Yes. If you're in that position in corn, you don't feel alone. You have a lot of people out there that are that are in the same position. Now, John, before we let you go, we've heard a lot uh, from the Federal Reserve, from President Trump, and we're expected to see interest rates increase. Is inflation a concern yet, or should inflation be a concern yet for producers? I think it should be. Uh, I think it should be a concern, really, for everybody in the country. I mean, I think we've, we've just deficit spent our way into a position where that's really, I think, our only way out of it. Uh, but uh, uh, it's being camouflaged now, uh, partially because the, the, that that's what the Treasury is trying to do, is to not move interest rates very fast and, and not tighten the supply at all. Uh, but also because a lot of people look at energy as the leader for inflation. And energy supplies are increasing fast enough that our price is cheaper it's not inflating at all. And so people are ignoring the inflation potential of commodities because of what's going on in oil. That's a mistake. 
the people are not going to be able to substitute oil for all the other commodities. And so you can have a, 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 an inflationary period, you can have the commodities inflating, even though you have one or two of them that are actually going to new lows. So I think that you just have to look at what's going on around the world, and the world is starting to come alive again after uh, having a, the worst recession since the Great Depression. And we're coming out of it. We're now several years coming out of it. And the stock market's roaring. And, I mean, there's a lot of positive things that are going on around the world. And so I think, I think people have to be ready for the next step of it, which is inflation. All right. You know, and if people don't believe there's inflation, go try to price a pickup truck today versus what you could have bought in 2012. It's unbelievable how much stronger prices are in the even in the used pickup market, which is where Pearson's do <laughs> our shopping. Say, what, what, what is the 2000 model <laughs> worth? <laughs> I hope it's quite a bit, because I've got several. <laughs> all right, now uh, before we let you go, John, we've got a question this week from a student up at Iowa State. We encourage all of you students of any age, if you've got a question you want to ask our, uh, our great analysts, get out your phone, Film a little question and send it in to us. This one is from Craig up at Iowa State University, John. With the direct incline in our population, how do we expect to feed the growing population of 9 billion? My bad, my apologies, that was not Craig, that was Michaela Dolch up at Iowa State. I'm very, very sorry, Michaela, that's what I get for not looking very closely. But how do we expect to feed the growing population? Michaela, we have to depend on farmers to raise bigger and bigger crops. We have to depend on the, 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 the genetics to be developed that will allow greater yields per acre. And, and what's interesting is that, that this was a, a serious discussion that was really thought uh, to, to be a problem we were going to contend with before year 2000. Uh, I started in the business in 1973, and uh, there were people writing books talking Paul about... Paul Ehrlich, wasn't he in exactly, the 70s? The exa population exactly, bomb. Exactly, exactly. And we were going to run out of food. There was no way we could feed everybody. And yet it, agriculture, for the most part around the world, uh, is a, a, a capital business, capitalistic business. And so people are able to to respond to the market forces. And when the market forces give us higher prices, we get lots more of the commodity. And all you have to do is just go back and take a look at when we got the big prices because of a crop problem back in 12 and 13. I mean, now we're, we're still buried under those supplies. And so um, uh, have faith uh, in the system, uh, and, but, but don't let anybody take over the system because taking over the system would be that which would cause us, uh, us uh, an inability to be able to feed people. And you can look around around at countries in the world today and they have exactly that problem today and that they can't fi and they can't figure out how they got themselves in that position and they can't figure out how to get out of it but it's all a matter of they 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 took the capitalism away from food production right that fa that's failure as long as the market can set the price you'll get people that produce to respond to the price signal that's exactly what happens well john roach thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us this week we always appreciate your insight thank you very much mike Join us again next week when Ted Seifert will sit across from me at the Market to Market table and we will focus on how one group of hog farmers is producing pork with a purpose. Until then, thanks for watching or listening. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week.